ceiling there. But like I said, he finds space really effectively in that offense. Um, he, in, he uses his body well, which really gave me that we have Brock Bowers at home five. So. And I'm done with you, James. I'm done with you, Braden, in the comments. We're moving on. It's time for the top 10 tackles. And we've got about 20 minutes to do it. So let's let's get going. These uh, bottom five guys we're going to kind of fly through. Because, again, this year's tackle class is Brock Bowers and then a couple other fellas and then a bunch of Jags, a bunch of dudes that just are going to be fighting for roster spots. I'm um, looking here at the consensus draft board. You, of course, have uh, – you, of course, have – the the top guy oh no it didn't refresh come on come back to me there we go brock bowers is number 10 on the consensus board um and then you've got the next couple guys between 60 and 80 and then everybody in the hundreds and 200s and 300s um my number one i just found this out today and just like doing some last minute research on the on the tackle class my favorite tackle in this class is easton dean uh number 460 on the consensus board he's from iowa state uh, and he, I'm guessing he has an RAS of like 3.7. So shout out my fellow Easton. We'll have an Easton stick who's bad at football in the league. And I hope that we have an Easton Dean in the league. That's also bad at football to represent the namesake. But let's uh, JT, let's throw up the, the bottom five. So our number 10 through six um, tight ends in this class. And I, I didn't even actually compare these. So let's see. We, we got a, a handful of these guys in common. Um, let's kind of actually we got most of them in common. Uh, I just I I have Tip Ryman on my list and you have Jared Wiley on your list. So let's let's start with those guys. And our, our general idea is not we're not again. These guys are in the 200 overall to 140 over 150 overall range. They're going to be day three guys. They're going to be mostly dart throws by teams. So we want to share with you the like a w one big thing on them. What is what is the thing when you take them as a day three pick? that you are looking for as the upside. What is it that you're banking on? So JT, I'll start with Tip Ryman, who uh, one of my favorite names in the draft, Electric, uh, played for Illinois. And the one big thing I have written down for Tip Ryman is that he is, man, and all my notes are just wigging out on me today. Here we go. Tip Ryman, huge athlete. That's the big thing with him. This is a big fella. 271, I believe. Let me pull up his uh his measurements here. Yeah, Tip Ryman coming in at yeah, two. I was right. Two six foot, almost six foot five, 271. A big, big fella. 98.4th percentile in terms of weight for a tight end. He's a really, really obviously he's he's gonna be a, a bigger impact in the blocking game than in the receiving game, but that's okay when he is as big as he is. So Tip Ryman, if you're looking for a big body that you think you can turn into a glorified offensive tackle, but you know, jumbo set tight end that maybe leaks out for a, a pass here or there, that's your guy in Tip Ryman out of Illinois. Yeah, and so with my first one here, um going with uh Dolan Holker from Colorado State. I see you have him a little bit higher, but the thing that stands out to me is just his the, the way he is able to use his hands. He's a very handsy uh, tight end who is really good at um, catching the ball and, and securing that catch. If you look pat last year, um, third in, in college football in contested catches. I'm and I, I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm going to be laughing at a lot of this because the way that you just... It, we're demonstrating just how cheeks this class is for for tight ends because your one big thing is he's very good at catching the ball and securing the catch. That's about all we can say about well, some of these guys. Well, I'm saying that's he's got a great catch <laughs> radius for him. But the biggest thing I, know, I think I with his ability in this class and why I think he could go a lot higher than than currently the the number ten spot is the way that he was used at Colorado State this year. Uh, his past two years. Um, in 2021 and 2022, he only uh, recorded 13 and nine receptions, respectively. And then in 2023, actually took a, a huge Ooh. workload on right. getting 64 receptions on 105 targets. I, I think just if he can continue to develop that way it, with the catch radius that he has and, and his contested catch ability, I think that he could become someday maybe a rotational starter for, for a team. But for right now, there's just... For me, there's not that much 
on tape right now that, that can show me he can do it all the time. And that's essentially the one big thing I had written down for him is that if you're looking for a productive baller, that's what he is. Not going to wow you athletically, not going to wow you with the size, um, not not particularly great at either of the two things you're asking for from a tight end, blocking or receiving the ball, relatively well-rounded and fine. But what he does, like you said, that that's that, oh, I don't know if he's a junior or a senior, uh, his last year in college, he showed that this guy is capable of a workload and just week in and week out being a, a, a productive part of your offense. My number nine player and your number nine player, AJ Barner, tight end out of Michigan. He is currently listed at number 170 on the consensus draft board. And the one big thing I wrote down for him is steady depth. This is a guy that is also well-rounded. He's an all-arounder type of guy. And you look into his production and you're like, okay, you know, that's, that's, that's a, that's a backup tight end kind of guy. Look at his size. Okay, fine. He's, he's pretty middle of the road athletically. Um, you know, he, he's a, fi- he's a fine blocker. He's got ideal size for being, um, a run blocking specialist. So if you want to use this guy kind of as a, a, um, a, a, uh, fullback, in a glorified fullback role, you can do that. And he, he's got good technique for those kinds of things. He's got a little bit of yak ability. Um, so Stony in the comments saying the cons of AJ Barner has clubs for hands. Yeah. He, he, he doesn't bring a lot to the table at, as a receiver and he doesn't bring, bring a lot to the table as a tight end or as well, Freudian slip as a blocker. You can tell him kind of struggling to say, to say a ton of nice things about him. He's like, he's number nine on my list. Cause he's just fine. And if you want a guy that can be, a third, fourth, fifth tight end on your team that you can like try to develop up and just be that locker room guy. You have him all around the franchise for a couple of years and he's he's a guy you can go to in a pinch. That's what I think AJ, AJ Barner is, but you know, he's a fifth, sixth, seventh round guy. I mean, that, that's what I was going to say as well. Well, I was going to talk about the reason why I have him on my list is because he graded out as one of the best run blocking tight ends in the league going from right. Michigan. Um, I mean, obviously the, the Titans for a long time have used just kind of a stir, uh, turnstile of glorified linemen at, at the, at the position with their third tight end, whether it be Trayvon Wesco or Jeff Swaim, Titans mm-hmm. legend. Um, but I mean, a guy like AJ Barner, I mean, he was one of the best run blockers in this class graded by PFF with an 81.4 run blocking grade. I wouldn't be mad if they took a flyer on him with the seventh round with one of their picks in the seventh round or even the sixth round as that guy who they can now get for super cheap uh, on that contract and then kind of have their 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 guy in that in that system that they can use for their running game. Um, but like you said, nothing really on tape jumped out of me as a um, pass catcher because obviously coming from a system like Michigan, there's not going to be a lot of those unless you really stand out. Um, but when he was used a lot, which is the run game, which is what Michigan was built on. Um, even though he did have clubs for hand, he still was able uh, to be pretty successful, whether that is a scheme thing or something that can be taught more in technique. That's why I think he is probably a day three guy, but nonetheless, I think um, he makes the top 10 here. All right, tell me a thing or two about Jared Wiley. He's the TCU tight end you got at number eight, number 200 on the consensus draft board. Yeah, this is this is a guy here who, um, using my Chris Collinsworth voice there, now here's a guy, um, or whoever says that, I forget. But anyways, uh, Jared Wiley, not to be You related. forget who says, now here's a guy? It's Chris I, Collinsworth, baby. Is it Chris Collinsworth? Mr. PFF, yeah. All right. um, Jared Wiley, not to be related with uh josh wiley of the the titans is a guy who i put on my list here kind of solely because i think that his size at the next level can can elevate him uh in into the nfl level here uh comes in at 6'6 249 i think he can add a little bit more size but because of that i think on those intangibles alone his 11.1 yards per reception showed that he was able to uh, be a decent receiver in college, especially in that TCU offense. And so I think the size can translate to the next level. All right. Our shared number sevens are Jaheim Bell out of FSU. And we're, this is where we're starting to get into the territory of tight ends that I frankly actually care a little bit about and know a little bit about, um, or knew about before this exercise and doing the research. Um, spoke to him at the combine, got a good head on his shoulder. Seems like a good kid. He, uh, the one big thing that I wrote down for Jaheim Bell tight end out of Florida State is separation, creativity, 
Yeah, because this is a guy that was utilized in the passing game quite a bit uh, under that. Um, so, oh, who's the? I forget the name of the coach at Fought, Tur Turner. What's who's the coach at FSU? I don't know. Whoever whoever's running that offense down there, they they he used him quite a bit um, in a relatively busy room. You know, he he was competing for um, targets from a Keon Coleman, from a Johnny Wilson, and still managed to get north of 500 yards and record a couple of touchdowns. Um, he, he's an athletic guy. He's, he was relatively productive in college. And so, uh, his big thing for me is he was re regularly separating from linebackers, uh, when he's up against a, uh, a, a non really a non coverage specialist in the secondary, he is able to exploit them. And even some slot corners, he's able to pull away from it at times, some of the le le lesser athletic players he goes up against. And so. I like a Jaheim Bell on, on a day three if you're looking for an athletic upside kind of guy. Yeah, that's what I wrote down as well. Super athletic ability here. 1.97 yards per route run, which is definitely above average for the college level. Uh, was eighth in, in college football in missed tackles forced with 12. The right. big downside for him and why he size. would never even make the top uh, of my top five here is size. 6'2", 241. That man is not give him tight end. Give him three more inches <laughs> and 20 pounds and this guy's a baller and we like him a lot very, more. Very, very good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's really where you can see him being a day three guy is that the size just isn't enough. And there may be someone on his team in college who would probably do well to switch to the tight end position and he switched right. to the wide receiver position. So, all right, with these top six guys, we're moving into the top 130 on the consensus draft board. So we're getting more and more relevant and we get to Eric all tight end out of Iowa. Number 129 in the consensus board. JT, what'd you have written down for him? Route running ability. I think that was something that uh, clearly when I watched a little bit of his tape was present. And I think that coming from a system in Iowa who has always given out and produced great tight ends. I think coming from a system where Lord knows running, that offense does not produce anything else, but <laughs> exactly. they do produce tight ends. Yeah. Um, getting, having that route running ability that's natural on top of the teachings, uh, I think is something that teams just like kind of the JJ McCarthy thing. It's like, he comes from an Harbaugh system. He gets a, a boost in, in where we're going to draft him. Eric all comes from a, a system who was, created successful tight ends time and time again. I think that matters to someone in the NFL. And I think that's why I think he has a lot of upside in this class. So that's why he's number six. All right. We are on to the top five and this moves us uh, on to, I believe we have, uh, we, we share our number five. No, we share a number four. Uh, we flip. So my number five is your number three. Your number three is my number five. So let's, let's skip over Theo Johnson and, and Ben Sennett, who we, we both like. He's your fifth guy. Uh, he's my third guy. Theo is my fifth guy. He's your third guy. Let's go to our fourth guy and talk about these two in a minute. And that's Cade Stover out of Ohio State. Um, this is a, a guy who's 250, 6'4", senior. Uh, not the youngest player in the world, going to be 24 this season, but he's a well-rounded, well-versed type of player who, if I had to write one big thing for him, is he, he he's actually, a, he, like the guys we just spoke about, he's an all-arounder type tight end that actually has the size and athleticism and past production to to prove him to be a guy you could actually see as starter upside. Yeah, so when I was doing my my study of Cade Stover, uh, the thing I kept coming back to is kind of like the mom, can we get McDonald's? We have McDonald's at home kind He's of thing. He's that at home version of the meal? Well, yeah. No, he is. He, oh. Can we have Brock Bowers? No, we have oh, Brock oh, Bowers oh, oh, at oh, home. Okay. Um, I think he's a guy who can create <laughs> separation on some of his routes. You look at what he was able to do uh, at Ohio State in his senior year. He had three deep catches, which was tied for 23rd in tight ends and 123 deep yards this season, which was 21st. Um, he's a poor run run blocker, but he has the athletic traits in route running, uh, but doesn't have that top speed that maybe a, an athletic Brock Bowers has at the next level. You look at some of his tape and, and you know, he is in space, but it kind of just looks like a locomotive just starting to get out of the station. But that's like the top speed for him. It's like, right. go faster. I wish you could go faster, but he just can't. <laughs> and so that's something in his game that I, I, I just think kind of limits his stealing there. But like I said, he finds space really effectively in that offense um, and uses his body well, which really gave me that um, we have Brock Bowers at home vibe. So when we do that kind of flip-flops episode later this draft mm -hmm. season, I think 
he'll be one of my guys that if you don't want Brock Bowers, you can wait like three rounds and get Cade Stover, you know? Like, and I think maybe that's the most extreme version version ever because exactly. Uh, it, yeah, I think this, like the spirit of the exercise is obviously like get a bargain later. This is just like be disappointed later more than, <laughs> more than anything. Um, but you, like, yeah, you point out the contested catch rate well above average yards per route run well above average not a run blocker. So you're, you're leaning on that, that receiving ability from a guy like Cade. Stover. He's a guy and that I, I think, um, yeah. like if the Titans drafted, if he was in last year's class and the Titans drafted mm. him instead of Josh Wiley, I feel like he is right. what they, the Titans want Josh Wiley to be. I think that's what you're already getting in, really? in a weird, in a weird way. Okay. Um, and that just might be my, my, uh, I don't know if I agree. Dislike, just, I'd, have to, I'd have to think my about dislike that. dislike for honest. Josh Wiley coming back around and just what I think of him as a prospect. But I, I think You're still a that, hater, bro. You're still I, a hater. You know, it's tough. But that's another thought that came to mind with with my evaluation of him. I, the last thing I'll say on, on Stover is I'm not positive whether or not this is a good or a bad thing. But you know, he played in that Ohio State offense last year, had his, his best season as a, a collegiate athlete, and I he played with a really bad quarterback that, that, that there's a reason that quarterback, I think he transferred to what, like Syracuse this off season. Uh, yes. he, he, yeah, he's, he's in no good. He's in no bueno. And that that's a, a thing that sometimes is like, well, if they produced with that guy, well, you'll see when they get with a real offense with a real quarterback. But then again, as the tight end, like, was he the safety blanket and getting more attention just because this guy really blows and was constantly dumping it off. I'd have to watch a lot more Cade Stover, actual footage, actual tape to, to know the answer to that. So let's move on the answer to is our kind of yes. Okay. <laughs> I All think. right. Fair enough. Kind of yes, but maybe because then again, could you say the same thing about Marvin Harrison? Or are you are you judging his? I'm game in on that. On that? No, I think I think the fact that Marvin was as productive as he was when he was having to do most of the heavy lifting and Fair was enough. not set up for success is a good Fair thing. Enough. But with yeah. a tight end, I just don't know. So uh, your number three, my number five, is Theo Johnson, and I'll let you go in on this guy because you're higher on him than I am. Uh, my one, my only contribution to this is if you want big, big athletic upside and you just want to gamble on a freak, Theo Johnson's your guy, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that's the first thing I was going to say. If you look at his measurables and where he ranks, 92 percentile in height, um, 98th percentile in hand size, 91 percentile in both the 40 yard dash and 10 yard split, 96 percentile in vertical jump and 93 percent in the broad jump um, while his numbers don't really reflect. I think we can do the opposite of um, the the kind of Cade Stover experiment there where he profiles out a lot in, I think, in the league to a guy like Luke Musgrave, Zach Kuntz, and Cole Komet, two guys from last year's draft that I was really high on, and then Cole Komet, who I've become really fond of lately as he has grown in this, uh, in his role in Chicago. Uh, he's a run, his run blocking needs work as a bigger guy. He he struggles in that part of his game, but I think a lot of his poor performance uh, can be chalked up to Penn State, uh, their system and, and the QB play that they've had post Sean Clifford. If you kind of look at the numbers of Theo Johnson, that's an amazing was, sentence. The QB play post Sean Clifford, which is worse than Sean Clifford is that's tough. Yeah, that's tough. And so uh, the numbers clearly dipped uh, post Sean Clifford, who was a draft pick and a former alumni of the same high school that I went Green to. Bay Packers, Go great. Bombers. Sean Clifford. Uh, oh, how about that? Sean X legend, uh, <laughs> Sean Clifford. Um, he even said in, in a couple of interviews that he feels like he did not show everything that he can do while in the system at Penn State, which is a little bit of a knock, I guess, to Penn State. But um, Bro's not even he got one foot out the door and he's like, I hated this place. They, they <laughs> it kinda, it kind of sounded like that in his interview. That's crazy. But, no, I think just based on the traits alone and his ability, I think he fits that mold. And it, I think he is a late day three guy that a team could pick up and put into the right system. I think he can really thrive. Uh, I, I have no nothing to add to that. And for time, we'll just keep moving on. But I, I like Theo Johnson as the the upside. I, I think that of of the non Brock Bowers tight ends in this class, he might have the most raw upside. As he's going to have to go. To, this is a he's a big nature versus nurture guy for me. Where he ends up is a big, big, big deal. Uh, if he wants to be used correctly when he believes he wasn't at Penn State, he better hope he goes to the right place. Stony stealing my thunder here. Ben Sennett. Let me tell you about my boy Ben Sennett, who I uh, was introduced to at the Senior Bowl. Uh, in January and have since continued to like, as I've looked into him and watched him and, and the big thing for him is man, if you need a fullback on your team, like Stoney says, he is fullback one big boy who is versatile and he's not the, um, he's not the massive player that is literally going to be a jumbo package glorified offensive lineman tight end. 
but he is a big body you can use in the run blocking game in that fullback role. He's a true, you know, jack of all trades type all around tight end serviceable enough in the the passing game to to be a part of that he was a walk-on at k-state uh, he played defensive end and tight end in high school and uh, became a full-time tight end in college but he's super versatile uh two years at k-state he lined up in the backfield in line in the slot did, did pretty much everything uh in in that system you look at some of his numbers had uh nearly 700 yards and six touchdowns in his final season in 2023 a very, very strong run block grade in addition to being a big part of the receiving game. Only two drops uh, on his year. Not a contested catch guy. It has shorter arms, so that's going to limit his catch radius, going to limit his ability to, to make the tougher plays. But he he's a good enough athlete to get out there, sit down in a zone, pick up a couple yards, be a, a first down machine in that way. So I like Ben Sennett for his all-around ability, his full back upside. Um, and and his production from college. It'll be really interesting to see where he goes. I, I also wrote down versatility in his game, his kind of sneakiness to to kind of get open in routes and kind of disappear from the vision mm-hmm. of of defensive backs was something that really jumped out to kind me. Kind of slippery out there. Uh, yeah. Versatility is the big thing, though. I think I wrote down that he could don the the J on on the roster sheet uh, for the Joker. And, and mm-hmm. that's where my comp to just a Caucasian version of Cordero Patterson came from. Which is a I crazy think. comp to me because he's like <laughs> half as athletic as Cordero Patterson. And that's the point. But <laughs> okay, all right, fair enough, I, I suppose. Um, and so I think that he, when put into the right system, like, could we be saying uh, ben Sennett's name, like we we say with Patrick Ricard and Kyle Juszczyk and all those guys in a couple of years, probably like, Get this man to be yeah. get get this man to be the next coming or the predecessor to or the heir I should say heir to too. Kyle Uzcheck in in Kyle Shanahan's system and I think uh, he would be there for a long time. All right, we're moving on to our top two guys. And by the way, Theo Johnson and uh, just for reference on the consensus board where these guys are going to go, Ben Sennett one twenty three, Theo Johnson one eighteen. So they're mid to late or excuse me, they are uh, early to mid day three guys. With these top three players, we're moving into the day two and, of course, day one with Brock Bowers, who, spoiler, is the number one tight end for both of us. Um, but um, we we have, and Kate Stover, by the way, I, I forgot, Kate Stover actually higher on the consensus board than both you and I have him. He's number four for us. He's 80th overall on the consensus board, so he actually is right now projected to be a, a mid to late day two guy. I wouldn't be shocked if he fell into the into day three, but maybe that's just me. Um, a, a clear cut day two guy, in my opinion, is Jatavian St- Sanders out of Texas. Um, JT, what's the one big thing for you from this guy? I, I, my ultimate reason for having him too, and I think a lot of folks ultimate reasons for having him too. By the way, I noticed you have number two Jatavian Sanders. Apparently, I have number two Atavian Sanders. So I guess my those bad. are different guys. Uh, <laughs> I I I I love him at two because he is a modern man's NFL tight end. He is the he is the fresh shiny tight end toy um he, he's the guy that's going to actually be in a can actually be an immediate impact in your passing game unlike a lot of these other guys not named brock bowers yeah i i, I didn't know if you had anything else to say after that um but for me it, he's a fluid route runner I, I, he's the second to bowers in that kind of category that i think right with what he can do on the field he's a yards after the catch monster uh, with the use of his hands and his power, you kind of see even if there's guys on him, uh, his yards after the after contact is crazy because he just keeps churning uh, with his legs. But then even with that, even though he is a powerful runner, once he gets up to speed, he still has insane hands. If you go and look at the the Baylor and the BYU game footage, he makes a couple just absolutely mm-hmm. circus catches. That, Impressive that contested catch rate, 53.8%, well above um, average in PFF's database for yeah, a tight he, end. He's a great athlete. He doesn't have the size in the world, but like like you said, he is the new age tight end where it's kind of positionless football, and I think he could find his way into a role somewhere with, with that. So that's why he is also my number two. Looking at him on tape, he, like most of these guys in this class are the kind of body, just like looking at them on the field, the eye test, they look like slimmer, more slender, more rocked up tackles or, you know, linemen. Whereas he looks like a beefed up receiver, beefed, like a, a, like a, a, a 
super soldier, super sized version of a, a true skill player, as opposed to a skill player ish blocker, if that makes sense. Um, he's one of two guys on this top 10 list for both for both of us that actually has the ver vertical ability, vertical threat ability in the um, in, in, at the tight end position in, uh, in, in this class. He's a mismatch for pretty much every linebacker he goes up against in coverage. He's going to be a mismatch against the right cornerback. He's big enough and strong enough and, and, and capable enough at the catch point to to win against smaller defenders. Um, but former five star recruit really, really high end athlete. Um, he, he just, if you had to find a knock for me, it's just he, like not quite as polished as you think you can, can be. He's still kind of figuring it out a little bit, but the upside is absolutely there. And I think a team is going to take him mid day two for that reason. Yep. I would agree. And then right. no surprise here. I don't know Brock if we really have anything to say. Brock I mean, Bowers is number one. Um, what can't he do? Yep. Can we, I, I, you know, instead of just talking about all the, like everybody's ever heard, everybody has already heard what Brock Bowers is an incredible athlete. Um, how big a deal. I think he's the only player on this list that I don't really care where he lands so much as um, I just think he's going to be good wherever. If that makes like, I, I think that he's the kind of transcendent athlete and, so capable in the receiving game uh, that he can be, you know, in a super modern offense, you, you know, you could put him in a, a role like a Kincaid was in last year with Buffalo and be a really reliable, consistent volume uh, member of a passing game. Or you can go to kind of an old, you, know, you could put him on a Mike Vrabel Titans on an old school kind of team, you know, put him in a Mark Andrews role with, with the Ravens when it's still a, a, a he run heavy team and still get the most out of him in that way. Yeah, I think the biggest question is where do you currently see him going in, in the first round? Because um, obviously we had the discussion a, a little bit ago about how, you know, is it really uh, that worth it to use a top 10 pick on a tight end, which the position isn't really the best value there? Have you, are you still believing that or has that kind of passed you up now where it's if, if you really like this guy, you should take him wherever? No, I, I, I am still firmly on the bad positional value. He needs to be kind of a, he needs to be kind of a value or not a value, a, um, a bit of a luxury pick for you. And I, I say luxury pick, like he's going, I think his ceiling is 10. I think he goes no earlier than 10. And I'd be surprised. I really would be super surprised if he fell out of the first round. I'd imagine he goes in that 10 to 20 range somewhere to a New York jets to, you know, you could see him being used as the 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 the, the complement to a Devonte Adams in in Vegas if they're wanting to supercharge that offense it's 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 a team that needs a versatile player um i you know what honestly i think he eventually will go once the top 3 receivers are gone and you get one team that is really desperate for an offensive playmaker and doesn't quite want to reach on a Brian Thomas yet or don't doesn't have a Brian Thomas nearly as high on their board as others and they say let's get a Brock Bowers in here cuz we need to put a jump start into our offense where that exactly comes in the teens. I'm not sure. Or just we'll see burrow to Bowers next year. And then that'll be 18 to the happy. Bengals. I listen, I, I would as a Bengals fan, you think Bengals fans would be happy with that, right? They'd be Surely. ecstatic for sure. Okay. I mean, if you, the last time they had a good tight end was that one year resurgence of CJ Uzama. And yeah, since then yeah. it's been Irv Smith and Mike Kosicki this year. And then, uh, you know, that's, that's it. I mean, having a guy like that, you, you might as well just trade T Higgins, I guess, but yeah, I, I think that's, uh, it's the end of our list there. Yeah. That's the end of our list. And that is one down 10 to go on the top 10 positional series of the 2024 NFL draft. What we have up next, I do not know. We we have been we've got a, a number of guests lined up. We'll have Austin Gale from The Ringer on with us for our second annual wide receiver edition of this episode, which if you are curious, that's on August, August, goodness, April 11th. So not this upcoming Thursday, but the next we're going to be doing our QB episode with Sean McAvoy, uh, QB coach to the stars. We've had him on the show many a time, and he also I was texting with him yesterday. He's been working out a lot with Malik Willis and Will Levis together this offseason has some thoughts and updates from those guys straight from their mouths to Sean's ears and then to our ears. So excited to talk to him about those guys. We've got our boy Stoney in the house again 
for a second year of our interior offensive line episode and our offensive tackle episode. And then a couple other guests that we're still, you know, we're still working out. Our people are talking to their people. We're figuring it out. But um, all of those positions coming up as well as a handful of fun draft games, um, draft segments that are, are interesting ways for us to talk about some of the best players in this draft and some of the value adds that you can have on day three, uh, as well as, you know, mock draft 2.0, mock draft 3.0 coming up until we get to draft night, which I don't, we haven't even mentioned on the show, JT, if, if folks are wondering, we, we are planning on once again, doing our live draft shows on night one and night two, day one, day two of the draft on that Thursday and Friday will be live. JT and I will be uh, from somewhere. We'll pick a location, but we'll be together and we'll be, you know, cracking a, a cold drink and having a good time and reacting live to what should be a really exciting draft. So stoked for the next three and a half ish weeks of our lives. Uh, you and I will be back on our Sunday episode. We are back to at least three episodes a week, folks, from here through to the draft. So Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, uh, those afternoons, are the live shows. We're also probably going to pack in some some Monday, you know, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday shows somewhere along the lines as well. Uh, Stony saying zombie three day three zombie marathon pod also in the works. We'll let you know what that may look like, but that may also be a thing. So. We will see a lot of awesome content. Make sure you're plugged in with us, following us at Hot Read Pod on TikTok, on Twitter, on Instagram. Make sure you're following, uh, subscribing to the Hot Read Podcast uh, on YouTube, Broadway Sports Media on YouTube, and the 440 Sports channel on YouTube. Those two channels is where, are where you can find us. Um, I think that's it, JT. I think we'll talk to them on Sunday, talking about a new position group. Until then, for producer JT, I'm your host, Easton Freeze. This has been the Hot Read Podcast. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>